I think we'll get started in a moment and we'll start with Ben and then there'll be a question and I'll have um, Ben will speak and then I will speak and then we'll have a hopefully time for a robust question and answer session for the second half of the webinar here. So um, I'll pass it over to my colleague Ben to start. Welcome everyone. Thanks Natalie and welcome. Um, hope everyone's doing okay in, in these crazy times. Um, so we're going to talk about our organizations and interventions and um, and ways that we are seeking partnerships. So, um, so Disaster Accountability Project is a nonprofit that I started after Hurricane Katrina to serve as an independent watchdog of disaster relief and humanitarian aid. Um, over the years, we've worked on reports and investigations looking at crisis standards of care in Florida and Louisiana to make sure that these um, plans meet the national recommended standards, which is very relevant now. Um, we looked at emergency planning in counties and towns and cities surrounding U.S. nuclear power plants to assess the completeness um, of those plans after the Fukushima disaster. And we've also investigated mismanagement of a recovery program um, after Superstorm Sandy that resulted in a, a successful complaint to the New York Attorney General's office that released $4 million to people who lost their homes. After the Haiti and Nepal earthquakes, we um, conducted investigations of um, where money was um, where money was going, who was raising it. And those reports basically helped us conclude that the wrong organizations tend to raise the most money after humanitarian disasters all over the world, both in the US and globally. And that this problem re repeats itself over and over that organizations with big brand names raise most of the money, regardless of whether or not they have an on the ground presence. And meanwhile, local NGOs see very little. and. This is, this is very well documented and the problem is not gonna go away on its own. So we built a platform called Smart Response to curate localized lists for how to help when disasters happen globally. And the, the platform essentially incentivizes transparency in the humanitarian sector by encouraging organizations to share data and then that data can be used to help donors identify which organizations are operating in a, in a location after a disaster and then donors can support those groups directly. The data is also very useful for coordination between organizations, uh, media um, covering disasters globally, even survivors finding assistance and knowing which organizations are responding and what types of services they're providing. In the first couple years, we've had over 500 organizations from 49 countries and uh, 22 states register and most are sharing data on the platform. So it's an exciting opportunity to change how money moves in the humanitarian sector while remaining uh, independent ourselves and not serving as an intermediary in that uh, donation process. Um, in terms of our current interventions in this, uh, in this crisis, we're an advocacy organization focused on response to disasters. So this is a very uh, much a moving target, this, uh, this current situation. Um, and that's, essentially why I started the organization to serve as a, as a watchdog and, and be nimble enough to focus on different issues. Um, our few interventions include smart response, which I just mentioned. We're collecting and sharing data about which organizations are responding around the world to shine a light on localized efforts. Um, so groups on the ground can get more visibility and support. Normal, normally, and this has been talked about a little bit, in many disasters globally, the entire world can focus on one area for better or for worse, and um, local organizations might see a little bit of money, but philanthropy can really focus and, and drill down on one area. With this, a lot of philanthropy is focused uh, locally for themselves, and as everyone in the whole world is experiencing this disaster, um, we're not seeing as much money move to um, smaller NGOs globally. Well, we're not seeing much money move to other parts of the world. People are really focusing in, in, in their areas. So, um, by uh, sharing this data, we're also incentivizing the transparency of, of local efforts and, and that data is um, getting shared. We have a, a pretty good list of organizations around the world that are responding and, and that's also growing. Um, rapid response, we're proposing solutions and, and addressing and trying to fill gaps in uh, issues such as healthcare, disability rights, vulnerable populations, food supply, production, leadership, and more. Um, we've been writing a lot. There's a lot of thought leadership needed, as, you, as you're well aware, and, um, and we're very much engaged in that. 
We're also working in uh, on investigations and we're partnering with state level disability rights organizations to examine the state level crisis standards of care plans that they have now to see how well those current plans meet the national recommended standards, which is what we did a number of years back in Florida and Louisiana. Um, but we're doing those investigations again, and many states are actually in the process of updating their plans. So we feel like um, we can have a real uh, immediate impact in helping states improve their plans by providing this, this information to them. Um, and then how these interventions aid in the long-term recovery. So it's really difficult to recover until we're out of a critical response phase. And I think that our advocacy and solutions can make things better right now so we can get closer to, um, we can get out of the critical response phase and closer to long-term recovery. Um, if, if community level organizations have more resources, economic recovery can, can be so much stronger. And so the goal is for uh, more philanthropy to, to identify organizations operating on the ground. In the US, I think they're doing a pretty good job. I think that um, there are many local organizations standing out and getting, getting coverage in their communities globally. It's more difficult. Uh, I think you know, the experience, our experience, with this uh, pandemic is very different from the experience of, of many, both in, in the US and also globally. Um, if you think about what we're, what, how we're able to, to um, stay at home and remain isolated and still have our luxuries, it's, it's very different uh, in many parts of the world. Um, so if there's a, a dedicated focus on implementing lessons learned recommendations, uh, we can help ensure that the expected second and third waves of the pandemic have lower infection rates and death counts. Um, and we can also do better in future pandemics and, and public health emergencies. Independent oversight is critical in helping the media better report, helping lawmakers better lead, and helping to shine a light on, on some sunlight on, on the gaps to make things work better is, is really important. Um, how the SDGs can be accelerated if we scale these interventions. Um, specifically, I think reducing inequalities, number 10, Good health and well-being. Number three, climate action, with regard to mitigation and ad adaptation. Number thirteen, but the work, this work touches on so many more: from water, sanitation, hygiene, poverty, hunger, gender equality, strong institutions, partnerships, and sustainable communities. Um, if if more resources are able to reach organizations on the ground operating in all of these areas, then um, obviously the the outcomes improve. Uh, in terms of partnership requirements, we are in need of some firepower, which really means capacity. We have volunteers working on everything, and we could do so much more with the professional team um, from outreach and organizing, communications, policy investigations. We have a team of 20 volunteer web developers working on Smart Response, and that continue, that may all continue to, to update and improve it. Um, we're seeking partnerships to add 2,000 more organizations to Smart Response from around the world so that we can have uh, reliable uh, uh, lists for how to help after after disasters um, globally and and really serve as uh, a resource for philanthropy um, and we're also seeking philanthropic partnerships to engage the the philanthropic community so that both CSR and foundations know to utilize this data when making decisions about how to help and we want to change how billions of dollars move without touching it ourselves and we think that with better data and having a resource like this, we can we can achieve that. So um, that's my presentation. Back to Natalie, and we'll have questions after. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. And it's great to have all of you here with us. Thank you to Catalyst Twenty Thirty, and also to Echo and Green. Uh, my name is Natalie Bridgman Fields. I'm the founder and director of Accountability Council. And the reason why we're here today is because vulnerable communities around the world who desperately need support from um, people like us really need to be heard themselves. They need people uh, listening to them in their own direct words, not people speaking for them. And I think, Ben, your organization is a great example of focusing uh, responses to crises on people who are best positioned to make clear what they need from a first person point of view. And that's really what we have in common here. So Accountability Council's work uh, is best seen through an example. And I'll give you an example from a, a over a decade ago, there was a really devastating earthquake in Haiti that took the farmland for 4,000 people in North Haiti, not because of the earthquake, but because of the earthquake response. 
when a sweatshop was created by the Inter-American Development Bank and USAID with the government of Haiti as part of that disaster response and in order to try to stimulate the economy of North Haiti, it actually devastated 4,000 people who were untouched by the disaster itself. Um, so this second disaster that befell them took away food security because their farmland was gone. Uh, it took away the ability of, of first girls to go to school, then all children to go to school from these farming families. And food aid has been a significant need in a community of previously self-sustainable farmers. For a decade, this community has worked to be heard. Uh, they weren't. Um, and then finally, they were able to be heard through an accountability office process just a number of years ago with our partnership and raising their voice to an accountability office tied to the Inter-American Development Bank. So what we have in mind is a vision of a world where communities can make their own argument for what they need to be heard, and then that charts the future of the response that then leads to lessons learned in the long term so we can not repeat the same problems of the past. So an example of that in Haiti is this agreement that was reached in December of 2018. We've now had um, just over a year of trying to implement a very, very complex but groundbreaking agreement where the communities negotiated for replacement land, so new land, agricultural inputs, um, a microcredit facility for women and vulnerable groups, jobs, as well as uh, really a sustainable platform in the community's own design to get back on track to create the resilience. And then COVID struck. So we'll come back to that in a moment, but I wanted to formulate this conversation with this example of these Haitian people who are really trying to be heard to speak on their own behalf and what that looks like and what the, the tangible way that they're doing that is. So I founded Accountability Council after a decade of using a different strategy, which was litigation, trying to make sure that um, we can address these imbalances of power. And with support from Echoing Green back in 2009, just, just as uh, was the case with Ben, I started my organization really trying to focus on what the highest leverage point was I could identify, and that was international finance, of looking at where these massive international financial flows are going out from powerful players in world capitals, from London to Washington, D.C. to Manila, really often without any knowledge of the people that they're impacting, that those decisions are even being made on their behalf, um, and without input from those people into those decision-making processes. And we see the harm that can result, which is really unnecessary harm. So that's what we're focused on right Right now is, is looking at shifting the whole system of global finance to be inclusive of the people who need to be making the decisions to make investment sustainable and work for people who uh, are suffering from the inequities that can result. So uh, Accountability Council's work is uh, placed into three different issues, three different approaches. We have our communities lawyering, which is an example of where we have lawyers directly working with those people in Haiti, as well as people in 50 countries over the last 10 years to help them raise their voices and be heard through these grievance processes tied to the accountability offices of international financial institutions. Uh, the second thing we do is policy advocacy, looking at the fairness, independence, effectiveness, accessibility, of these accountability offices. So our policy team based in Washington, DC, their goal is to make sure that these accountability offices are fair and effective to help look for gaps. Some of the gaps we're seeing now, um, even though we've had this system for several decades in some cases in development finance, impact investing and emerging markets, um, increasingly green finance funds do not have accountability systems right now. Given the volume of money coming out through COVID response, we're seeing a total shift in how the global economy is uh, paying much closer attention, and we'll see if it bears out over the long term and shifts of where money's going. But it's now is the time to take the lessons from the development finance experience and embed those into private and emerging market finance, and including impact investing, to make sure that community-driven approaches to accountability are part of the governance frameworks moving forward. Um, so our communities program, our policy advocacy program, again, looking for gaps, trying to keep the existing system fair and effective, but then also taking the lessons from the cases all over the world and feeding them into that systemic change. Um, finally, we have a research program, and the goal of the research program is to get all the information we can from the system and really mine it for lessons learned. So we have an, a database called the Accountability Console of every complaint ever filed to every accountability office. There are now about 1,300 of them. And we're able to use that information for all types of decisions, to understand what's going on in sectors, by institution, by region, by country, to see what's gone wrong in the past, to learn from it, and to be able to advocate for systemic policy change to address these problems. 
Another example of our research tools is Zwazo, which we created out of our case in Haiti, really needing a way to message people in very remote areas who don't have a lot of, um, who have no internet connectivity, but really have a lot of need to be involved directly in decision making. So that's a system where based on a Twilio phone app, we were able to design um, Zwazo to give messages in Creole, uh, directly recorded by a community member who they know, um, and then get direct feedback from that voice message system into our own case in Haiti to do live work on implementing the agreements that we reached. Um, but then we readapted in light of COVID, we readapted Zwazo to be able to be used in the Bay Area to be able to understand the acute food needs of some of the vulnerable communities um, that exist within our own community here in San Francisco. So that's an example with basically no resources, how we've been able to repurpose Wazo. So one of the partnership examples of, of things that we need is to look at what would it look like if we actually resourced building out Zwazo as an adaptable tool that we could help people customize and really deploy at a much larger school to uh, scale to do community level needs assessment and support as we get that community feedback into a regular system of practice. That's one example of where not only will that support urgent response based on the needs of COVID, especially when people can't travel and be uh, in communication with people in person to do consultations, but that's something that really should outlive COVID of a way that all international institutions, investors, um, people who deploy projects or humanitarian aid and disaster response can be in direct contact with people without having to go there as a supplement, um, as a tool that can, can help when in-person contact is not available. So those are some of our communities uh, program policy and research tools, but I wanted to highlight some of our specific um, things that we're doing, particularly related to COVID that really tie into these long-term sustainable development goals as well. With our work in Haiti, as well as our work in Assam, India, these are two great examples where we've identified acute needs because of COVID that are needs that happened because of international financial institutions having the incorrect approach to begin with. So we need to have those communities at the forefront of receiving the responses now so that we're not repeating those same mistakes. And in the case of India, in Assam, India, we're supporting tea workers who live on plantations where they're modern day slaves. The, there are no health and sanitation protections um, that are preventing them from an absolute humanitarian disaster. So we've been in very close and constant contact with them, understanding how a partnership could really aid in bringing in resources to get basic health and sanitation measures that will help them now to resist um, and provide resilience for the COVID crisis, but also sustain their livelihoods going forward. This is part of the community resilience, community um, even peace and security work. Um, all of these issues create vulnerabilities that make issues ripe for conflict that we can avoid by showing up communities now. Similarly, in our policy work, we can work on uh, climate action is one of the SDGs where, again, the money flowing to um, uh, all of the COVID response can be the same methodology that we're using now to include community voice and accountability systems can make sure that climate finance hits its mark just as COVID response aid money hits its mark. So that's one of the themes of the, day, of the day that our policy team in DC is really focused on at the moment. And we need partnerships to be able to engage with decision makers, financial institutions, the political apparatus that, that moves those institutions forward uh, to be effective. So um, I wanted to maybe end with that and open the majority of this call to questions and discussion, which uh, knowing a lot of you on this call, um, I, I know it's gonna be a, a rich conversation. So we'll. We'll turn it over to the Q&A and talk about how we can make sure that um, aid and disaster response is centered in a community-driven approach. And we have um, a chat line if you wanted to chat a question, or you can simply open your microphone and go off mute, or you can even raise your hand, so uh, whatever approach you prefer. And I will maybe start off by saying, um, Ben, it's been a pleasure to work with Smart Response. We're one of the organizations working on gathering a community-based needs assessment from our communities in Haiti and elsewhere to be able to directly input that information into Smart Response. So this is an example of our organizations partnering together, not only on this urgent COVID response, but as part of these overall larger, bigger pictures, reframing of whose information matters when we respond to a disaster or, and when there are needs. So Beth, feel free to kick us off. 
Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for that. That was incredibly helpful. I know there are a number of people who have the impulse to help here, and yet it's so easy to just give to the usual suspects. Um, and as we know, there's a filter down, and you know some of them are very good, but they're not necessarily reaching the, the most local populations. So I guess as a question um, for Ben, Ben, I, I happened to click on your Spark Response link, and I see a number of organizations listed there. Are those have those been vetted by you in the sense that you're in a position to be able to recommend that donations go there? Or are you simply at this point compiling resources? Um, and then I noticed that a couple of the donate buttons were grayed out and I'm wondering if that's simply because they don't accept outside donations or are, do you have some concerns about it or have you simply not been able to kind of sync up with their, um, with their um, fundraising arms? Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so we do vet organizations before we approve them on the platform. We, we check them to make sure that they're legitimate organizations, that they're operating in the areas that they say they're operating, and that they're, we OFAC, so we make sure they're not on a, a um, sanctions list, so we don't want to go to jail for telling people to donate to them. Um, so that's, that's um, what we do. The data should speak for itself, so we're not we're not saying that each organization is uh, amazing, except for Accountability Council. Um, and I mean, th there are some, some gems in there and we're not um, endorsing every organization um, fully. I think every donor needs to do that due diligence. What we're helping to do is take, uh, take a list of potentially thousands of organizations after a disaster that are all asking for money and help people narrow that list to groups that are actually operating locally. Those groups don't have to only be local organizations, but they need to be sharing enough data to be listed on these on, on the platform. The, the grayed out donate buttons um, represent a, a, a major problem in that a lot of local organizations around the world have a real hard time accepting online donations and they don't have merchant accounts. And this is a thing that we'd like to try to change. Um, we are encouraging organizations if they're comfortable to put uh, their bank details on their website, which many groups do, so that people can um, ha get that information uh, for, for the sake of transfers. What we're finding is that when major disasters happen around the world, people, you know, a lot of these organizations lose their power for any, any amount of time, or they're just really busy because they're in the middle of it and their family's affected and they're affected. So they're not able to do the, the PR that's necessary to fundraise. So the goal for this platform is to, is to allow their data to sit outside their organization almost like a common grant application worth of data so that the platform will, will automatically curate or smartly curate these lists based on local staff, direct services, the completeness of their profiles, um, and whether or not we've had to actually uh, inter in interfere with their data if they've put bad data and we had to take it down. That affects their, their sorting order on the site. Um, but um, there's also their direct contact information. So if there's a grayed out donation button, someone can easily contact them and work out a way to support them directly. You'll, you'll notice that many groups have partners that, that are names that you know. So some groups may, may have a partner that's Oxfam India or USAID. And so if they're working with these large uh, you know, intermediary organizations or, or international NGOs or, or government agencies, then they've been vetted by those entities as well. And they may have, they likely have a way to accept funds. It just may not be an online online solution right now. Great, thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, we have Gabby next. Thank you and thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting, especially for us in Latin America. Uh, right now we have issues in every country where people is uh, asking the government's for response because there's accusation of corruption uh, related with money given to help uh, directly to governments. And the situation here is most of the donors, international donors and agencies and philanthropists prefer to give the money to the government. And we have this kind of accusation or give money to gigantic international organization that even have an uh, office in our countries, or if they have an office, it's an office to create campaign and to do advocacy, but not to work with the communities. How we can change that mindset in the donors and philanthropists, especially in regions as our region, 
uh, what we can do and how we can assess the local organizations who are really doing the work. This is my first question. And the second question is how we can talk with the donors and companies who told us, I prefer to give money to that gigantic organization because they have the power to do communication or campaigns. And I prefer to link my brand with someone who can, you know, be in the Today Show or uh, New York Times than a tiny organization who is working in a community and don't have a team to fill the forms to get a grant or to do communication or campaigns because they are working. Ben, I think you might be well placed to start, start the response okay. to that question. So um, we have to start somewhere. And, I, and these are issues that um, organizations around the world are facing. So it's not just Latin America. Um, you know, I think you'll find that even local organizations in the US have a lot of the same challenges. So, um, so starting somewhere means that these local organizations need to be um, more easily identified and they need to find ways to build trust. And I think that Part of that is starting with a way to share their data, because if you just did a Google search for some of these organizations, you wouldn't find them. And so it's going to be difficult for donors to support these organizations if they, if they can't trust them. So Smart Response is, is trying to build, to begin that trust building process by allowing them to share data for free and create profiles with data that donors want. Um, and then when we think about it, these local organizations don't need that much money to actually do a good job and to build their capacity. So we don't need to win over all donors to change the system for local NGOs. We need to just win over some. And, um, and then for these large international organizations, um, they're not all bad, right? And it's better for someone to give to a large international organization that's actually operating in country than to give to a large international organization that doesn't even know where that country is on a map. And that's sadly, the situation we're in for many disasters where organizations that raise money may have no connection whatsoever to the location for where they're fundraising. And so even if we can help donors decide between these large groups, that's better. But I think putting these local groups on the map, helping them share their data, giving them a profile, and then as they become stronger, they can have more capacity to create their own websites and do their own bidding. Um, and um, you know, we got to start somewhere, but the, the UN and the World Humanitarian Summit set these uh, goals for localization that were quite low. And ultimately, a lot of these goals are being achieved by these big international organizations creating uh, local uh, country offices and saying, oh, well, now we have local entities. So donate to our local entities and you'll achieve your localization agenda. And um, that's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a joke. So. Um, we are allowing those organizations to register on the platform because they're some of the worst offenders for transparency. They, they're so big and they rely on their brands. People donate regardless of whether they're sharing data or not. So if we can try to create um, a way for donors to, to give based on a, a, a platform and, and based on data sharing, then we can try to prevent these big groups from raising money when they're not sharing data or when they're not operating in a particular location. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I have thoughts on that too, but I'll first let me see if there are other other questions um, that want to maybe either add to that or, or make any new points. And while we're waiting for questions, maybe I'll just add, um, there are a lot of movements uh, to advocate that the big international financial institutions do more direct work with small community-based organizations. So I would say that's one other point that um, there are a lot of movements to request that the international development finance institutions, for example, the World Bank, do direct cash transfers to even individuals, but then also local civil society organizations more effectively so that the blockade is not simply big, um, often quite corrupt or even abusive uh, governments who are not getting the the support to the organizations who are best positioned or the communities who are best positioned to use it effectively to, to benefit themselves. Um, so devolving that power to uh, more locally grounded um, entities to be able to deploy that through a needs-based assessment that's much more local. 
um, cutting out a lot of the uh, stages where we know that money gets siphoned off. So that is a long-standing movement that I think has a, an opportunity to be heard maybe a little bit more now in the COVID crisis, but it's, it's certainly not a new uh, movement. But um, let's, let's open it for any other questions. Erin, I see you off mute. Yes, and I even turned my video on, so I'm very brave. Um, you spoke a little bit about modifying the community needs assessment tool that had been used in Haiti for use in San Francisco. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. How long did it take to modify it for use in another mm -hmm. context? Mm -hmm. And then how is it working? And mm -hmm. kind of what has been learned from using that tool that maybe was unexpected or really eye-opening for people who were accessing the information? Oh, fantastic question. So this is, again, this is back to the question of Zwazo, which we've uh, used successfully in Haiti. And the lesson in Haiti was that the tool itself is useless unless it's part of an existing social structure that's going to be able to understand how to use it and then take the information and move it forward. So I think that's the first really critical piece is this is just not something you just deploy and you're done. This is a tool to aid in an organizing effort that's already underway. And if it's done that way, it can be very effective. And so the reason why we haven't just simply scaled, deployed it, used it, sent it open source, and voila, is because of that, that that takes capacity, right? To understand how to train existing social movements or, or environmental movements or disaster recovery movements on the tool, not just to simply deploy it without that support and that wraparound information. So that was that's the first learning in Haiti. So it was, um, and actually I might open the uh, opportunity for Jamie to talk about the AROC experience, uh, describe what AROC is and how this was used. Uh, Jamie's my colleague at Accountability Council um, who worked with our research director, Samra Arabi, to de actually deploy this in the Bay Area. So Jamie, do you want to maybe weigh in here for a moment on what that deployment looked like in San Francisco with, with uh, AROC? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and hi all. Um, so we, um, AROC partnered with Accountability Council to really quickly adapt this. This was really right after the start of this crisis. And uh, we have a lot of community members through AROC. AROC is the Arab Resource and Organizing Center um, who don't speak English as their first language, um, are already dealing with um, immigration issues, um, just really not set up uh, to respond to this uh, moment. And by adapting the Zwazo tool, we were able to push out mass messages to our community members to um, set up a mutual aid network. So we got requests um, pretty immediately from folks who weren't able to leave their homes to get groceries. We had some young mothers um, who were at home with children, not able to go out and using the um, connection through Zwazo, we were able to get um, community members with a rock to deliver groceries directly to households and we're continuing to use it um, and really increasing that mutual aid network so now we can if we have an update from a rock if we have resources we want to connect uh, community members to we can send out messages and get feedback in real time um, so it's and we're continuing to um, to adapt and use that tool Thanks, Jamie. And I wanted to add that in our case in Haiti, one of the, the um, ways that we've tried to have this be used as a tool more broadly, because I think that the development of it was, um, you know, our research director spent, you know, maybe a, a couple months worth of time developing it total. Um, and then what the benefit of it is, is that it can be pretty quickly adopted, but it's all the learning of how to deploy it effectively that's very time consuming. But the Inter-American Development Bank is the um, in entity's accountability mechanism that we partnered with in Haiti around these agreements we reached and that we're implementing these agreements with. They've seen us effectively use WAZO. They've requested that we help them use this tool outside of Haiti for the other cases that they're running all over the world, um, in, the, in the case of the Inter-American Development Bank through Latin America, um, to be able to reach the communities that are, again, a known, it's ideal for a known group of stakeholders that are hard to communicate with, but there's a discrete set of audiences that you know need to communicate with you and vice versa. So that's an ideal setting where we're gonna be 
we're looking for partnerships to help us raise money to actually deploy that effectively outside of Accountability Council's own work. So that's the ideal uh, use for that research tool. And it looks like Steve had, yeah, yeah, great. Hi, um, my apologies for coming on a little bit late. I've had some internet problems and also some maybe coughing. I've been, uh, I'm five weeks into um, the corona and, um, yeah, recovering still. So, um, yeah, really very interested what both of what you're, what, what you're doing. I'm just curious in terms of dramatically the scale of the challenge, you know, if we want to, be very honest about it we've got irresponsible corporate and government behavior on a unprecedented level we've had it for many years um who are the actors that you would um well let, let me kind of leave that question um institutional investors a relatively small number of them control um or have an influence with um uh you know a great deal of publicly uh, traded companies and the, the, the finance providers um debt providers etc to what extent would you like to better um uh utilize that um that influence of the institutional investment owners effectively um as a method of influencing corporate and government behavior and yeah. I, I was looking at your annual report your revenue or your uh, your um funding is a, just under two million dollars or i think it was last year Mm -hmm. So what would you, in an ideal world, what would you push that number up to, yeah. to be able to optimize, you know, your activity, the deployment yeah. of your tool, and um, which sounds like it's a really interesting approach. And then yeah. another follow on, if you don't mind, um, I'm giving you a, a little bit of a list. How often do organizations come to you and say, we'd like to embed your um, um, uh, accountability provision in what we're doing how we're engaging is it ever <coughs> are organizations ever proactive in that way financial services or otherwise oh brilliant Thanks. questions yep great great so we have the list so um first we want we want to go to six million dollars we're at two and the reason is because we see uh, we have a, a very detailed scaling plan because our policy team needs to have people embedded in all the world regions to directly communicate with the regional um, and uh, even national level organizations doing phenomenal work, but who aren't able to effectively influence these global level financial flows. So that's the first piece of it. And then the community's work really needs to be done uh, in an in-depth way. And what we do is we focus on the last mile as the Haiti case is an example where you get to an agreement, it's beautiful on paper, but then there's a huge amount of work that's required to turn it from paper to practice. And that's what we specialize in is making the entire system work for communities, not just for optics, right? And so that's the investment that's really needed um, in the communities team, the policy team, just growing the power to do that work. The research team has two people right now. We need a whole team of people dedicated to just running the database, to building out tools like Zwazo and building Zwazo out itself. And then there's a whole lot of work to be done to developing a whole host of other tools that we can see from a needs assessment basis that are coming in that we can deploy and develop. Um, but what we're, but to your question of what would the policy team do, and what are we doing now that we want to scale? It's the reason why we're focused on impact investment, we spent a decade working on trying to build out better accountability frameworks for private sector financial institutions. We've pivoted that work a little bit because we've been running just up against a wall and the groups that are working on regulatory compliance for corporations to do corporate accountability, they need to be pushing their foot on the gas while we work on, on the other hand, impact investment, where there's a natural captive audience of groups that are private sector investors, big asset managers who have huge endowments or assets under management for simply uh, shareholder maximization that also have impact funds. It's those groups that we're focused on in particular that we think we can build out the case for why community driven um, uh, accountability frameworks to make uh, the opportunity possible for communities to be heard by international investors, um, asset managers, that there's a business case for that, there's a reputational risk case for that, and that those have to accompany strong standards. So safeguards that cover human rights and environmental protections that really have mutual benefits for all. And so our own caseload's building that case and we wanna build it out more broadly. I mean, if I could just say, I mean, I've spent around 10 years in, in the impact space. Um, I'm working to create um, what we call a private sector development bank. Um, 
uh, with uh, platforms and funds that are really about getting impact and scale. And I think many people realize that the impact measurement <coughs> is, um, is one of the, uh, is, you know, it, it's still very tough because relatively uh, while the assets are growing, Volume is really very low, and you know it's kind of a mom and pop industry, and it's extremely um, uh, inefficient in my view. So I asked a question in the chat, which was, uh, "Is there a way of differentiating between effectiveness and, and ethics of credibility?" So you know, if you take the SDGs, I, I you know deem them as risk and resilience threats. I think they've even been you know misnamed. They shouldn't be goals. They should be risk and resilience threats because goals are nice to have, but these things are, are really life and death as we know uh, mm -hmm. right now and um, that aside you know ultimately we um, really believe that, that we need models that can scale that can deliver maximum impact <coughs> there's an awful lot of duplication in the NGO world but also in the impact space and there's a, a lot of um, great work for sure the great work that in relative terms is having fairly minor impact uh, in the context of, of this world that needs to change pretty rapidly, you know, especially when one takes into account climate and, and other issues. So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious to that. And going back to the pivot point <coughs> you might have been going to ask it um, about the institutional investors um, mm -hmm. who are deploying that capital into impact funds and and elsewhere you know so sorry for just um interjecting but um i you know impact is the impact space there's an awful lot of um uh, rhetoric um there's not really the um accountability that it needs but i Correct. really like what you're doing i think there is absolutely you know you're pushing on an open door that's partially open but uh yeah i'm just curious as the plan to get to scale as well well, we'll have we'll have a good follow up conversation on that. Lots to discuss, Steve. Thanks for the question. Agreed. Lots more, more lots more there. Would love to make sure we open it to other other questions. And if not, Steve, we can talk about impact investing for the rest of the call. But we'll <laughs> make sure I open it for um for others to get to get questions into. Everyone's excited for the impact investing segment of the conversation. I see. Last chance? No. <laughs> we do have um, 15 minutes left, I believe. So please feel free to ask questions um, to either Ben or myself on any of the topics or each other for that matter. Ooh, I get a free 15 minute video call with you, Steve, to talk impact investing, measurement, and management. <laughs> um, I'll take, I mean, I'll take it if I can get it, but um, let's see any, we have um, any other questions here? I'll, I, I will, I would like to answer Steve, you want one of your specific questions, which is about scale, of course. And this is why uh, accountability councils, not just focused on small individual investors. We're not s simply focused on a couple foundations that do impact investing. We really are looking at these big institutional investors with an eye that we can, if we can get um, leaders in the impact investing community that cover all the market segments of impact investing to agree that accountability is important. And we've started this conversation um, over the last four years we've been doing this. So over the last uh, two years, we've started to get basically an agreement that in it is important as a value of, to hear from people you impact, to understand your net impact. That you can say all you want that you're having positive impact, which is very difficult to measure as um, everybody probably on this call understands, but understanding the negative impact is impossible if you are not opening yourself up to receive information about the negative impact you may be causing that might directly undermine your impact thesis or cause other um, secondary harm that is unrelated to your impact thesis, but might be under, undermining your business operations as well. So um, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in the field writ large on net impact. But the way that we see Accountability Council being able to serve um, developing impact investing to move in an urgent direction to be ethically bounded and to avoid impact washing, green, blue, and even pink washing that we're seeing is to make sure that the information from communities who are harmed feeds in so that there's an incentive in the first place to consult with local 
multiple people as investment decisions are made as a matter of course. And that's the same thing we're doing in development finance and have for many years, um, is trying to build out the case for why it makes sense to front end consultation, which is already required by development finance institutions. And what we're hearing is a lot of the um, institutional investors rightly say, oh, well, that's expensive right? It's expensive to do community consultation. And how would I possibly get there? It's expensive to send a consultant out that far. Um, and and I, I wouldn't even know how to communicate with those people. If that's the answer, you really don't know what you're investing in, right? You, if, you, if you can't figure out how to understand the local context, then you're investing in something you, you admittedly don't understand. So our argument is that, that uh, the whole model of how decisions are made in investments that touch land, livelihoods, gender, people, real estate, um, all of these investments that touch uh, people in the outside world, they need to be shifting and so that we're benefiting from local knowledge and letting people be heard at that, that global level. We have a case in Myanmar that I may just end with, which is a phenomenal example of this, where UNDP Myanmar invested in a top-down conservation project with the government of Myanmar who has a pretty notorious record for illegal logging in protected areas, for example. Um, and in this case, it violated the peace accord with Karen indigenous people in the Tanahathuri region, which has a coastal mangrove area and a forest preserve that need to be cared for by the Karen indigenous people who've cared for this land for generations. But the project was done in a top-down way that envisions kicking them out of their land. So these are people displaced by the war, trying to stay there and then return there who instead of being the conservators, traditional conservators are now gonna be undermined. So this is a complaint that they were able to file because UNDP has an accountability office and there was an original duty they should have been consulted under the UNDP's rules. They were able to file a grievance, a compliance investigation is happening. The investment is now on hold and the community has put forward what a ground up conservation plan for that entire region looks like and it's ready for investment. This is another one of our partnership opportunities. The Kanahathri Alliance, Kanahathri um, Conservation Alliance, it's called CAT. They have a proposal that they're, they're, they're ready um, to share with the world in a couple of weeks. And it's exciting because that's, it's a concrete example of what these accountability uh, offices can do to open investors' eyes to a totally flipped dynamic of, of what investment can and should and arguably must look like for us to meet these sustainable development goals. So happy to take questions that are unrelated to Myanmar, impact investing, climate finance, <laughs> or any of the topics that, um, that we've begun to talk about and open it back up. We have 10 minutes remaining, so happy to do that. And if not, just an enormous thanks to everyone for joining us today. We know this was a very late, late notice, um, noticed call. Uh, and so we're pleased to have um, good geographic spread from a number of people. We're, we're recording this session, so we invite you to share it with anyone who uh, you think might be interested who couldn't make it today. Um, ben and I remain available to talk offline about partnership opportunities that we've highlighted today and for any other um, collaboration that people think is, is um, possible. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, all. Take care. Steve, feel better. Yeah. I was where you are in February, Steve. I did recover. It's good to be on the other end of it. It's it's a dark it's a dark time. Yeah, it was pretty horrible. It's been, uh, I didn't get a hospital, but it was. Uh, it was pretty close a couple of times and yeah, no one wants to get this. Nobody no. wants to get it. It's really, yeah. it's not fun. Yeah. Anyway, thank you thanks for your work that you're doing. Uh, if there was a second more, I just wanted to ask, you know, what do you want? What are you looking for the most? You mentioned partnerships, both Ben and Natalie. Who would be your sort of top five wish list? Yeah. So from where we stand, we, we have this scaling plan that needs resources. So we just need to, to scale this. We're, we're fundraising basically an annual budget every single year through one year donations from foundations. So right. we need multi-year core support very clearly because that gives us the breathing space to then think about how to be more effective instead of um, trying to scramble for the next year. So that's a, a very basic thing. Um, but then these, these partnerships and alliances, it's political pressure. It's, it's investors willing to use political clout 
to publicly state that this is important. And I think that that kind of high level messaging and partnership on communications, on putting people's money where their mouth is, um, is incredibly valuable. So that I think the, the question back to you is, where do you see your leverage? And that's the question we ask to anyone who wants to partnership because partner with us is because where people's leverage lies is, is uh, where the question should start on how people can partner, of course. Um, but maybe turning to you, Ben. Yeah, we're also um, trying to scale and we need capacity support to do that. It's all donation based right now. And we think we can create a revenue model that can make, make us self-sustaining after a couple of years of, of a slightly larger team. I'm the only full-time person. We've built this entire platform and done all this work with just me full-time and a, a, an amazing team of volunteers. And that's just not sustainable to try to achieve the scale and impact that we want to achieve. So I think that our size has been, um, in many ways, um, a good thing for many years because building the platform, it took a while and we didn't have results to show necessarily for impact. And a lot of donors don't have the patience for that. So it, had we had a large team or a larger team, it would have really been hard to meet payroll during that period of time. But now that we have the platform and now that we have adoption by organizations around the world, I think we're ready to add some booster rockets. And we need a couple of years of much larger size of an organization to, to implement a revenue model that keeps us independent. And, and I think we can change how a lot of money moves in the humanitarian sector um, with just with a slightly small, larger team. I'll check out both of your projects, but I just wanted to say, Natalie, um, yeah, there was an example of uh, a few years ago, uh, Jeff Sachs with his uh, Millennium Villages project. And um, I've got great respect for Jeff. I've met him a couple of times and, and um, yeah, he's a great thinker. But this was a project that was really about creating projects on the ground. And, and what was interesting, there was something in Nigeria where just pretty close to the area where his uh, Nigerian project was, uh, it was an integrated development um, uh, project I supported and helped uh, Zai, um, a friend that introduced it a number of years ago called the Transform Foundation. And they did agriculture and uh, uh, health, and they even had a Cisco Academy in a very rural, uh, rural, you know, tough part of Nigeria. And for all the attempts this guy had to interface with um, the Millennium Villages project, um, the, the person who, who ran the foundation, um, absolutely no way would they be listened to. No way could they actually get their knowledge and expertise and, and, and just real hard fought wisdom uh, or hard won wisdom, they couldn't get it listened to. And the project ultimately, the Millennium Villages you know, failed and had you know, some controversy. But you know, it happens time and time and time again, top down approaches where there's no right of reply, right of response from the people who have the knowledge, have the understanding, what they don't have is the access. And that sort of top down, kind of bottom up, you know, uh, um, challenge is what it seems that you're addressing. And I think it's um, really, really important to get it to scale and to get it widely understood because <coughs> yeah. ultimately, you know, it's, uh, it's never going to change if we're just trying to shoehorn or force you know, yeah. theoretic solutions down on populations. And without Absolutely. the voice that they can, um, they really need to express, you know, yeah. they're lost. They and Steve, that goes, that goes to incentive structures. And I think the easiest place to, to deal with those incentive structures, um, obviously, is at the point of regulation. And lots of people are working that, on that for the private sector and are not, not making the headway that we need. But on development finance, that's, an, that's the same problem exists where we're moving you know, a trillion dollars through development finance with the wrong incentives. The incentive is still mirroring private finance. It's getting money out the door and you get your promotion and you get moved up instead of what is the development outcome of the money that I'm moving through the door. And so that's the incentive structure that I think needs to shift so that community consultation, which is again, how we get to, is this a project that uh, you're co-creating or that you are creating and that we are supporting better 
um, is an option because it's not going to be a, an option that's realized, even though it's already in policy, unless we can do the incentive structure fix. And that's why part of our policy team's growth is what we call the root cause initiative that we want to fund to be able to run, uh, which is a campaign to shift incentive structures and development finance. It's a huge project. So we're not taking it on until we're ready to really run with it and full court press on it. So um, it's an example of, of, of how that trim tab on, on uh, the ship of development finance really needs to move. Thanks for uh, your responses and apologies for hogging the court a little bit, but um, in, no, pleasure. In, when the pleasure you joined. All right. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining.